Well, good morning. He is risen. Amen. We're glad that you have chosen to spend Easter Sunday with us here at Maranatha. If you're a guest with us, it's your first time here, we would invite you to visit the Welcome Center on your way out and grab a gift that we have for you. Also, we invite you to text the word guest to the number on the screen, and that will start an automated a process of, of getting in contact with us, and we can see how we can serve you and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, I have to mention in two weeks, we will have a business meeting uh, for our Sunday evening service. It will be uh, two weeks from tonight over in the multi-purpose room. Uh, Luke Fawcett and his wife, Gina, are they here? Oh, yeah, they're, they're in the back. They're standing. Look, Take a look. Yes. All right. So Luke Fawcett and Jana will be joining us this summer, and he will be interning here. And so we're going to meet together for a business meeting that evening to just discuss how we're going to care for them while they're here with us. And so welcome, Luke and Jana. And uh, I, I'd like to begin today with reading a passage of Scripture that kind of continues where we left off on Friday evening. Would you guys stand together? Luke 24, but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And just a few verses later, we see this picture of Peter. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. We have the full revelation of the Word of God. And today, almost 2,000 years later, what are we still doing? Every day, when we fix our eyes on Christ and on the gospel, we are still marveling at the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus. We're going to sing this song together and behold this mystery together. Behold the wondrous mystery, 
Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stand.
be seated. Happy Resurrection Day. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, you alone are God. You're majestic, you're high, you're seated there on your throne. On this day especially, we're reminded of the cost, and we can't fully understand it, but we're reminded that you watched your son be born into this world to live his perfect life. You watched those final weeks and days and hours. You watched his suffering. Lord, you watched the cruc crucifixion. You watched him being killed and being buried. We understand also, Father, by faith that Christ is alive today and that tomb is empty. And we're so grateful that you accepted his sacrifice. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to obey even to death, death on the cross. Thank you for your victory over death and sin and hell. Father, thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Thank you for calling us by your Spirit to faith. Thank you for the gifts that you bestow on us. We recognize we certainly do not deserve them. Our lives, apart from Christ, are ruined. They're broken. We're lost. Except in Christ and through the resurrection, we have hope. We know for certain that we will spend eternity with you, and we are grateful. Father, our hearts are broken as we remember loved ones and friends and co-workers and neighbors, and they're without hope, without your peace. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would expand your kingdom, you would, your gospel would reach around the world, and that your spirit would draw more to yourself and into your family. Thank you for the word of God, the power of the word to change lives. As it's preached today, God, I pray that the power of the Spirit of God, using his word, would change and draw many to yourself. Even for our own hearts, Lord, as those who know you, Lord, there are areas in our lives that you want change. You want us to look more like Jesus. So may we humble ourselves as we hear the word of God, may we give glory to Christ, our lamb, the one who was slain, the one who alone is worthy. And we praise you in his name. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, before I sing the song, I just wanted to introduce it really quick. Um, over the last year, there's just been a lot going on in my life, uh, a lot of different trials and whatnot, but there's been, been one thing that I can keep my eyes on, and that is the gospel, that uh, Christ Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised to life on the third day, and he's alive today, uh, and with that in sight, with that gospel in sight, uh, those who believe in the name of the Lord will be saved, and uh, that has just been such a great encouragement to me. So uh, this song is called, There is One Gospel. <laughs> there is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity it is my story my father's plan the son has rescued me oh what a gospel oh what a peace my highest joy and my deepest need now and forever he is my life Oh, 
sing together. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name.
Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bo Williamson, and my wife Anna and I have been attending Maranatha since 2020, and we've been members since 2021, and we have two beautiful daughters, Ava and Sophia. Um, It's about a year um, ago that I was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of leukemia. And since then, I've spent two months in the hospital, received multiple chemo treatments and full body radiation. And uh, this past November, I underwent a bone marrow transplant. Needless to say, uh, my battle with cancer has been a very long and traumatic experience. And not just for me, but for my wife, my daughters. It's deeply troubling to face your mortality, and it's painful to imagine what life would be like for my wife and my kids should God decide to take me home early. You know, when circumstances are favorable, it's easy to sing and pray phrases like, not my will, but yours be done. But when you're battling cancer, it feels so much more costly to pray something like that. Needless to say, our faith has been put through the fire. And, um, but you could also say that God has carried us every step of the way. He's been so faithful in our lives. And, you know, many times he allowed the suffering to continue, and it felt cruel in the moment um, when he did that. But he gave us grace to endure every single pain that we felt through it all. One of the ways that he provided for us through this year is through so many of you here at Maranatha. It's been incredible to see the glory of Christ's body in action as so many of you have prayed for us consistently and loved us and showered us with gifts and food and financial support, and we thank you for that from the bottom of our hearts. You were the hands and feet of Jesus serving us and comforting us along our path of suffering. About a month ago, several tests were run uh, to see if there's any residual cancer in my body after my transplant. And today I want to share the good news with you that every test came back negative and there is no detectable cancer in my body anymore. It's been observed that when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, the only thing that perished were the constraints that bound them. Throughout this journey, our prayer has not only been that that God would take the cancer away, but also that he would sanctify us and preserve us through it all. And God was faithful to do that, and it's a work that he's continuing to do in us today. Romans 8.28 says that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. 
God is using our trial to do a good work, not only in us, but also in you, because you joined us in our suffering. Something that Paul also said in Philippians 1.6 is that I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete, bring that to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's doing a good work in all of us, and he's so good for that. Will you join me in giving him thanks and praise? Gracious Heavenly Father, you are so good. You're so good to us, and we don't deserve it. Lord, thank you so much for what this day represents, the resurrection of your Son and the resurrection that, that offer, that, the offer of resurrection to us as well, God. Thank you for taking care of our greatest needs, and that is our need for you. Thank you for taking away my cancer, and thank you so much for answering our prayers the way that you did. I pray for those today who are suffering. I pray for those who maybe haven't gotten the answer that they've wanted or, or desired or thought they needed. I pray for those who are grieving. God, would you comfort them? Would you draw them close to you, hold them close in your arms, provide for their every need, Lord? Give them grace for every step. I pray today, Lord, as Pastor Andrew, Andrew takes, gives us the word that, Lord, you would speak through him, that you would anoint him, and, um, and I pray that you would make it so that our hearts can receive your word and that we walk out of fear changed. Thank you so much for who you are and all that you do for us, Lord. You're so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think we can all agree in rejoicing with Bo and Anna this morning as they have experienced not only the power and grace of God, but in deliverance of this bone cancer. Bo, I know, and Anna too, I know this has been a challenging journey for you this past year. I know it's been a sanctifying journey, as Bo has shared. It's clear that God has carried you and has helped you through this process, and I'm grateful for how this church fellowship, the family of God here at Maranatha has come beside you. But just as there was this hidden cancer that Bo experienced in his bones that needed to be dealt with, there is a cancer that is hidden, perhaps, maybe not so hidden, in all of us, and it, and it has the certainty of leading to death. Not just the potential of death, but the certainty of death. Of course, that cancer is not the cancer of the bone, but, but the cancer that goes much deeper than the bone. The cancer that goes to your heart, the cancer that goes to your very being, the, the cancer that goes to your soul and will lead you in the next life to either life with God, if it's dealt with through the resurrection, or life away from God in dealing with, confronting, condemning your sin away from God forever in hell. This morning, we're going to focus not on the details of the resurrection per se. This morning, we're, we're going to deal with the benefits of the resurrection. What did the resurrection accomplish? For all of those who have faith in Jesus, what did the resurrection accomplish for you? What do you have to look forward to? What do we have available to us because of what Christ has accomplished for us through his death and through his resurrection? This morning, we're going to see that the joy that was true of these women who went to visit the tomb is a joy that we also can experience, not only in a temporary way in that Jesus rose from the dead and the expectation of their hearts and all that that meant in being reunited with Jesus, their master, but the eternal benefits of forgiveness for sin and cleansing and a life with God that we all have to look forward to because of what Jesus did for us, commemorated on this morning, resurrection morning. 
As we think about the, the past week, the, the, the week of Passover, this Passion Week leading up to the cross, we think about all of the dizzying realities that took place during that week. The week which began with promise, with anticipation, with a thrill of expectation as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. The praise of the crowds, thousands if not tens of thousands of individuals who streamed out of Jerusalem to the city of Bethphage, which was just about a mile away, and paraded, paraded Jesus into the city for the, with the cries of, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord laying palm branches, laying their, coat, their coats on the road as they ushered Jesus, identifying him as king, respecting him and honoring him in that way. It all sent a clear message of hopeful expectation. The king has finally come. And all the people of Israel finally acknowledging the truth of Jesus' true identity. He was the king. He is the king. But the, the, the week continued with enthusiastic reception of Christ's ministry. Every day, Jesus taught in the temple, as we find in Luke chapter 19, 47 and 48. It says this, And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were, were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. This eager anticipation, this hopeful thinking and, and expectation of who this was, the teacher, hanging on every word. Every day he's met by thousands of enthusiastic followers. We find that in Luke chapter 21, verses 37 and 38. Every day he was teaching in the temple. But at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning all the people came to him. In the temple to hear him. Every day, Jesus is in the temple teaching. Every day, thousands of people. To the extent that, that Luke will say, all oh, the people of Jerusalem are streaming into the temple to hear him. This expectation, every external indicator of this week was the climax of Jesus' ministry. A clear picture that he would finally be the person that they'd been hoping for. This king. This hopeful sign that salvation was sure to come. It was right around the corner. But then Friday morning happened. And everything changed. For these women, news of Christ's arrest would have come as a shockwave. The entire city was a buzz. They, they would discover that, that Jesus had been taken at night by a mob of men with swords and clubs, led by chief priests and elders of the people. Jesus undergoing interrogation by the high priest, accused of blasphemy, experiencing abuse of the mob who spit on him and struck him. Then there was even talk of crucifixion. He was handed over to Pilate early in the morning and Pilate who actually had the authority to send Jesus to death. How could this have turned out this way? How could the enthusiastic reception that punctuated the air on Monday, how could it have turned so quickly just a, sh a few short days later? What happened? And as the offense of the early morning unfolded, Jesus would be delivered over to death. He would be sentenced to crucifixion. He would be scourged by Roman authorities. He would be taken outside the city. He would hang on a cross and die. Die as a criminal. The stunning, unbelievable turn of events would have come as a shock to these women. Hopes and dreams devastated. Anticipation of deliverance annihilated. Longing for a king. To finally reign on David's throne. Obliterated. All that remained was the broken, lifeless body of the one they called master. Laying in a tomb. Wrapped with haste. All that remained was the memory of three years of friendship and comfort and teaching and wonder and hope. And in this moment, on this morning... All they wanted to do was pay their final respects 
one last time to give the body a proper burial, to honor him through this act of reverence one last time. So they make their way to the tomb. Imagine the scene in your mind's eye. This emotion is all bound up in the hearts of these women as they make their way to the tomb. Imagine yourself in this scene, walking with these women as I read this passage from Luke 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And Matthew adds, So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And ran to tell his disciples. We can't even begin to imagine the emotion that they are feeling in this moment. Bombarded with a combination of surprise and hope and joy. Our focus for this morning will be this final phrase. They departed with fear and great joy. They departed with fear and great joy. This same joy is ready to meet every one of you this morning. Whether you have already placed your faith in Jesus Christ and have received forgiveness for sin and and have participated in the resurrection in some way, this new life that has been purchased for us through the death of Christ and his resurrection, but, but maybe this morning you need that joy to be renewed. Or perhaps you've never in your life placed your faith in Christ. You've never experienced the joy of the resurrection. The the welcome invitation of the resurrection draws you in, invites you to participate in the joy that comes because of the resurrection. So this morning, we're going to spend our time and turn our attention to joy. That's the centerpiece of what Paul is sharing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here we'll see five reasons for joy that come to everyone who experiences or places their faith in Christ because of the resurrection. So turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 961. 1 Corinthians 15, page 961. We're going to see in the first few verses that we have joy because of a reliable witness. The resurrection bears testimony to the reliability, the credibility of the scripture, and that should lead to joy. Look with me in verse 1. It says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day accordance with the scriptures. Here we see the reliability of the scripture, that the testimony of the word of God spoken to us at the end of verse 3 and the end of verse 4 in accordance with the scriptures. We can have joy because the word of God is true. Paul reminds this church of Corinth of the gospel. It was the word he preached. It was the word they received. It was the word on which they could stand. They could be firm. They could be established. It was a place of commitment, a place of security, a place of rest, a place of stability in life. It continues to have its effect as we see in verse 2. By which you are being saved. The word of God had had borne out in their life, had, had saved them, but not just in a moment, but it was saving them and preparing them, preserving them for that future day. Their life was experiencing the benefits of the salvation 
It wasn't momentary. They're enjoying and experiencing those ongoing benefits of the gospel, the, the word of God that had been spoken into their life. But, but more than experience, more important than experience is this message. This message that should bring them joy because of its trustworthiness. It is sure. It is dependable. It's confirmed. For hundreds of years, the prophets had described the life and ministry of this future messianic figure. And here we see in the person of Christ a fulfillment of all that had been prophesied. Christ's death should not have been a surprise. It was Christ, after all, that had shared with his disciples on at least three occasions there in Galilee that that he was going to die. What awaited him in Jerusalem was death, but on the third day he would rise. But part of this prophecy that perhaps seemed troubling, seemed elusive, seemed distant, was this impossible prediction made by David a thousand years earlier that Christ would come and rise from the dead. Psalm 16, verse 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. This word, Sheol, is the Hebrew word for grave, and and applied to Jesus. You will not allow the Lord to remain in the grave. You will not allow his body to experience decay. Confirming the testimony of the prophets, demonstrating divine power, establishing once and for all, That the gospel is true. We have a reliable word. Unlike any other word in all the world. We have a word that is sure and dependable and trustworthy. But also the reliability of eyewitnesses. We see in verses 5 to 8. Notice. And that he appeared to Cephas and then, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. His resurrection confirmed by by Peter and the apostles, confirmed by James and the apostles on a different occasion, and confirmed by the 500 brothers at once. And then, of course, confirmed by Paul himself who saw the resurrected Lord on his way to Damascus. You have a sure word of God, a message of truth in a world that longs for stability, a a world that longs for truth. This should lead us to joy because we know that the scripture is true. It's concrete. It's dependable. It's sure. Something on which we can stand. And through that dependable word of the gospel, we are recipients of grace. That's where we turn to next. The grace and joy that we can enjoy. We can, we can have joy because of indwelling grace. Notice in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. God's grace is not vain grace. It accomplished its purpose in Paul. It accomplished its purpose through Paul as the apostle Paul is is ministering the gospel in the known world. This is not a static grace. This is not a stagnant grace. This is not an empty grace. This is a grace with power, a grace that mobilizes, that activates, that puts things in, in motion. It's a a grace that works, that moves, that energizes. Why? Because it's a grace that changes people from the inside out, that raises them to spiritual life. It's a grace that frees them from the bondage of sin. And then it's a grace that also indwells the promise that was given by Jesus to his apostles even the night before he was killed. He said, it's good for you that I go away and then the Holy Spirit can come. We are no longer dependent upon our own sufficiency, but because of the indwelling grace of the Spirit, we can depend on divine sufficiency for everything in life, including ministry that God calls us to. 1 Peter 4, 10 to 11 
as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. God gives you grace not just to save you from sin, but to put you to work. His Holy Spirit, the grace and strength that he gives through his indwelling spirit calls you to more. You can carry out your Christian service because of indwelling grace. You can grow in grace. You can serve in grace. You can conquer sin because of indwelling grace. All this is possible because of the work of the Holy Spirit that God gives to us because of resurrection. But while we serve, what keeps us going? Another benefit of this resurrection as we move to verses 19 and 22. We can continue to serve with indwelling grace because of life after the grave. We can have joy because of life after the grave. Notice in verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, but by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as an Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. There is an existence after the grave. Either resurrection to God through faith in Christ or eternal condemnation away from God forever in hell, in condemnation of your sin. This life is not the end. And so this life is also not heaven. It's not meant to be heaven. It's not meant to satisfy. It's not meant to lead you to ultimate joy. It's it's not meant to be lasting comfort or security for you. But, But it is meant to point you to heaven It's meant to point you to the the one who can give you comfort and security. It's meant to to provide you lasting satisfaction that only comes from him. Jesus' resurrection guarantees that death introduced by Adam because of sin is not final. Jesus As the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, he is this picture of what we have to look forward to. He is this new reality for those who trust in him for forgiveness. And because of this life is not the end, we don't have to be overwhelmed by our circumstances, overcome by our suffering, discouraged by our lot in life, defeated by our pain. We don't have to despair because we have no hope. We can continue to serve with indwelling strength because we know what is coming is better than what we have today. There is life after the grave. There is something worth living for. Because of Christ's resurrection, Christ gives us hope. And therefore, we have joy. Christ's life has made us alive. We anticipate being reunited with him. That's what we see at the end of verse 23. At his coming, those who belong to Christ, reunited with him. And then what? What happens next? That's what leads us to the next joy that we find in verse 24. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. We can have joy because of Christ's supreme power. That's what's next. The power of Christ on display for the world to see. These words spoken with certainty. There is no hint of failure. There is no shadow of an alternative possibility. The language is emphatic, written with certainty in fixed terms, with no possibility of variation. Literally, then the end. He will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. 
He will destroy every rule. He will destroy every authority. He will destroy every power. He will reign until he's put every enemy under his feet. The last enemy, of course, is death, whom he's already conquered. He's already destroyed. He's already demonstrated his victorious, conquering nature. Christ is supreme. And because of his supremacy over every power, we should exalt with joy. We have nothing to fear. There is no weapon that's fashioned against us that can stand. There is no power that can separate us from his love. There is no authority that can interfere with his plan. There is no power in the universe that can rival Christ's power. And Christ will reign. In every authority will bow the knee, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will happen. Every power, both visible and invisible, in heaven and earth, will bow the knee to the supreme king of the universe, Jesus. Now, we come to the culmination of all these truths and how they relate to the here and now. Paul is now summarizing them and, and putting them all together and applying them to us individually. Finally, we see we have joy because of the promise of fruitful life that's found in verse 58. Notice it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Do you hear the joy in that statement? Do you hear the victory of that statement? There is purpose in life. There is meaning. There is promise of product productivity, of impact and fruitfulness and influence. That your life, following the course that God has set, will make a difference. It will be useful. It will accomplish the purposes for which God intends it to accomplish. Paul brings this truth of the resurrection home to the individual. He summarizes these truths in, in this, this one statement. Therefore, in other words, as a result of all the truths that I've just shared in verse 15, here's what you have to look forward to. Abound in the work of the Lord. That is your call. The call of every believer who trusts in the resurrection of Christ, who has enjoyed forgiveness of sin, we must abound in the work of the Lord. It is this ongoing characteristic of who we are. We're to super abound, to be in excess, this abundance, to have more than enough, this abounding work that our life is marked by, the work for the Lord. We work for Him. We can do it as one who is steadfast, notice, to be firm, settled, and steady. We can do it as, as one who is immovable, who is firm and unshaken. We can do it with confidence. Why? Because your labors in the Lord are not in vain. This word not is a ne negative particle. It's one of those words in the, in the Greek where there is no in the absolute. It will not ever be in vain. That's the word that Paul uses here. Why? Why will it not be in vain? Well, it will not be in vain because of the truths that we have learned. It will not be in vain because we have a reliable word, a word that is true. It's dependable. It will have its way. It will not return void. It will not be in vain because of God's indwelling grace that strengthens our lives and provides fruitfulness for our endeavors. It will not be in vain because of our hope in a life after the grave, which stabilizes us, which settles us, which mobilizes us. It will not be in vain because of a supreme power of God who cannot be opposed, who cannot be resisted. And everything that he does will be accomplished. His purposes will stand. So we don't ever have to lose heart. We don't ever have to be discouraged. We don't ever have to wonder if our efforts matter. We don't ever have to think of our energy as wasted. Because the resurrection, 
God proves that every obedience will be rewarded. Every work that aligns with his will will be fruitful. So the pressure to perform is lifted. The burden to measure up is eliminated. The weight to keep up is removed. That burden rests on the almighty arms of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Lord, alone. In the living power of the word to accomplish its work, that word will not return void, and that should lead us to joy. So who are the recipients of this joy? Who who are those who can participate in this joy of the resurrection? All of these amazing promises apply only to those who believe and embrace the truth of the resurrection. Who have come to the place of seeing who they are and how their sin separated them from God and how their sin must be paid for by Jesus on the cross. That Jesus had to die for your sin. But he didn't remain there. He didn't remain in the grave. He, He was resurrected. He was resurrected to new life to introduce for each of us who believe in Jesus as the only way and confess that he is Lord, we can experience forgiveness. We can experience newness of life. We can experience the joy of the indwelling spirit which helps to lead us in a fruitful life, an obedient life, and a life that that demonstrates change and transformation, making Jesus Lord of our lives. Trusting that Jesus' resurrection offers us something significant. Newness of life, freedom of sin, power of the indwelling spirit, a community of faith, mission and purpose that God has given to us in his word. But those who are not in Christ do not have this promise. The resurrection has no power for those who who disbelieve. The resurrection has no power for those who turn their back on the wonder of who Jesus is. The resurrection has no power for those who choose to continue in their rebellion and hostility against God. Only those who come, admit their sin, confess before Christ, ask for his forgiveness, and understand that he's the only way. This morning, are you experiencing the joy of the resurrection? Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, Is there a draw of your heart to want what Jesus offers to all of us through resurrection power? It's something we're meant to enjoy, not just for a moment, but day by day. As we come to look at what Christ has accomplished for us and freedom from this life. Unburdening ourselves from from the sorrow of sin. Cleansing us so that we can be free. If this morning you have not come to a place of ever having experienced or witnessed that kind of resurrection power, this morning we would love to introduce you to Jesus so you can begin that relationship and experience the kind of power that this passage is referring to. Might we all live in the power of the resurrection? Oh God, we praise you. For what you have accomplished for us through your death and resurrection. We pray that our lives would be marked with this kind of joy. The joy of a life that shows that you are at the center. That we're looking forward to something greater. That we're not settled in the here and now. But we're looking forward to eternity. We're on mission. We're those who serve you in such a way that it marks us out as those who are separate from this world. Those who have enjoyed something special that has changed them from death to life has given them this indwelling power, this indwelling grace that we referred to in our passage. God, I pray this morning if anyone here does not know you as their Savior, that you would work in their hearts and draw them to yourself so that it might experience this kind of rescue, salvation, and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, close our time with singing.
sing together. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior. joining us today. Have a happy Resurrection Sunday.